Hello and welcome. It's your friendly neighborhood narrator, Sue, here. Get cozy as I share with you. Sometimes terrifying, sometimes heartwarming, but always thought provoking encounters of Bigfoot, Dogman, and the straight up paranormal. I post new videos every day, so be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And with that, let's get right into it. In Ventura County, an unknown ape-like creature walked upright out of the thick patch of bushes and stood looking for several seconds up and down the fire lane. I cocked the hammer back on the thirty-two caliber carbine, shouldered the weapon, and began to press the trigger. Something in my mind ordered me not to shoot the creature. I call it divine intervention. I asked myself if it was a bear. No. I instantly decided that it didn't look like a bear because there was not a long protruding snout jutting out from the face. Besides, bears were not legal game in this area of California. It certainly was not a buck, never mind the fact that if it was a deer, there were no horns on this animal. I immediately told myself it looked more like a monkey man. I can hear myself today saying those words out loud. What the heck is a monkey doing out here in the mountain? In the meantime, as I made the move to shoulder the carbine and spoke those words, the big animal turned toward me from the waist up. Looking over the sight of the little carbine, I observed this being to be about seven or eight feet tall, with well-muscled, long, hairy arms hanging down to the waist. The hands looked almost human. I remember noticing these things, as I slowly put down the gun. This creature was completely covered in long, dark brown hair from head to foot and appeared to have a huge barrel chest. Some other striking features that I noticed were a flat, square jaw, a flat, dark-looking nose, no noticeable hair on the face, and a sloping forehead. I don't remember seeing any signs of ears on the animal, too much long hair around the sides of the head, and there was no discernible neck. Since I had no idea what this creature was, I've always been glad to have instantly decided not to shoot it. Thank God for protective angels. The other thing I thought about at the time was, could this be some idiot in a monkey suit playing a prank on some hunter like me? But then, only a village idiot would dress up in a monkey costume and roam the mountains during deer hunting season. As I contemplate the incident today, I realize now that this was a Bigfoot, and it had both seen and heard me. I could not tell what the sex of it was because of all the long, dark hair around the body. However, now that I have seen numerous showings of the Patterson film, which Patty was documented, I must guesstimate it was a male and gender. Within 10 to 15 seconds, as quickly as the creature had entered my field of view, it calmly made about two strides across the open fire lane, parted some tall bushes with well-muscled, uplifted, hairy arms, and disappeared into the thick brush. Right away, I noticed that it was standing inside the screen of thick brush alongside the fire lane like it was watching me. I could readily discern the huge, dark shape as it stood there for possibly a minute or so. Apparently, it was looking at me, sitting up the hill on the ground. I didn't know it at the time whether it was going to attack me or leave. I kept the little carbine in the ready position across my chest and slowly stood up to get a better look at this unknown animal. I decided at the moment when I stood up that if this thing would charge me, I was going to run back up the hill to my dad unless it got too close to me. Then and only then would I consider shooting the animal. I admit it. I was scared, fit to wet my pants. I now recall seeing the bushes shake violently and the dark shape stepped out of sight. I slowly sat down again and listened to its rustling footsteps as the huge ape man descended down the hill away from me. Boy, I was glad it was gone. Now the shake started. If I had been smoking in those days, I would have lit a cigarette and probably smoked the whole pack. Finally, after about 15 minutes, when the stillness was broken by singing birds and scurrying chipmunks, I got up enough nerve to carefully go down to the spot 
where I'd seen this creature. Was I dreaming? No, because there, in the loose dirt, I saw a couple of huge, human-like, barefooted tracks where it had crossed fire lane. Then, a raunchy odor hit my nose. I remember thinking it smelled like a horrendous fart. In fact, at the time, I, I decided to call it the fart creature. <laughs> I know that is not a very endearing name for such a marvelous creep, but that's how my scared brain was working that fateful morning. Deciding that now would be a good time to leave the area, I quickly walked back up the hill to where I had been sitting and stood there for a few minutes. Clearly, I had seen something unexplained. Now, I had to decide if I should tell my dad or just keep quiet. To tell you the truth, I was afraid to tell my father because I knew he would never believe me. I thought he would most certainly take my hunting privileges away for seeing boogers in the hills. I began slowly walking back up the fire brick toward my father in the piney flats above me. I remember now that he had asked me why I had left my deer stand so early. I think I replied I was hungry and bored and at not seeing a buck right after daylight. He probably chewed me out for leaving so early, but at least I didn't incur his wrath for telling a booger story. It was on a mountain saddleback ridge close to Pine Mountain Campground. On to the next one. It was October that Dirk and I had decided to roll both of our chairs under our desks for five days and head south to the Kiva Wilderness in California for a little mental health break. The two of us, being avid runners and cyclists, planned to do a little mountain biking and hiking. On our first day, we made our way up to Walker's Path and returned in the afternoon, spending the rest of the evening and night in our camper. On the morning of our second day, we had decided to head up a little north up to Onyx and we hiked into the Domeland Wilderness. We were about four hours into our trek when we decided to cop a squat leaning against a large pine in a really beautiful spot in the woods. We were sitting side by side when I suddenly realized that Dirk was snoring, having fallen asleep with his head on my shoulder. So as to not wake him up, I sat very still which led me to falling asleep as well. This was by no means a strange happening, for the two of us were physically and mentally exhausted from our busy work schedule. Which is why, after all, we had come here. I know now that we had nodded out for about an hour when something whacked me on the head. It had startled me awake. I jumped up, but, believe it or not, Dirk was still sound asleep. Wondering what had hit me on the head, I looked down and saw a pine cone lying on the ground. At the time, I had just assumed it fell from the tree, having not looked up at the tree itself. Feeling sorry for Dirk and not wanting to wake him, I sat back down next to him and closed my eyes. I now know that I had fallen asleep again when I was yet again awoken from my snooze by something smacking me on my left cheek. This time, I said ouch, and awoke Dirk from a siesta. So this continues from Dirk's perspective. So, Danielle starts telling me she was hit by two pine cones, one on the top of her head and the other against her cheek. I looked at the two pine cones and then up into the tree that we were leaning against, but the tree had no pine cones on it whatsoever. Then, we both started looking up into the trees as I was pointing out to Danielle that the tree had no cones on it to drop. It was at that time that we heard a slight crunch coming from our right-hand side, which was where a gigantic dead pine tree was lying on its side in the wood near us. We both looked at the same time and saw nothing, so I began to grab all of my stuff to begin our hiking back out. It was then that Danielle tapped me on the shoulder and mouthed the words, Look over there. She was pointing at the top edge of the pine laying in the woods. As I began to focus 
on what she was already seeing, I noticed what appeared to be the crown of a head covered in brightly colored red fur moving back and forth behind the tree's trunk. Suddenly and without warning, a head began to rise above the tree's trunk and a pair of black eyes became visible that were staring right at it. Danielle grabbed my arm intensely and said to me, Oh my God, what is it? No sooner had she said that than the head ducked back down. I said to her, Let's grab our stuff and get out of here. Continuing to watch over our shoulder as we gathered our packs together, this creature, which we could see was a Sasquatch, stood to its feet behind the log. It turned and began to walk away, at first very slowly, and then at a very rapid pace, disappearing into the woods. The total elapsed time from its standing to being gone from view was maybe twenty seconds. I remember letting out a huge sigh, which told me I had been holding my breath. The tree trunk was about two feet thick, and this creature was at least five or more feet taller than it was. The moment I saw its face, it looked like a pale-colored pancake. It was very flat and round, with no hair on it whatsoever. The rest of its body was covered in long, rust-colored hair. I say hair because we could see gray-colored flesh through the hair virtually everywhere on its body. It was extremely burly-looking, having somewhat the body of a grizzly bear standing on its hind legs. But make no mistake about it, this was no bear. It walked away quickly and perfectly on two legs without a hitch. The two of us stood there for about ten minutes in an utter daze after it was gone from view. Neither of us were able to believe what we had just seen at the time. It was like an out-of-body experience for the both of us. After it was long gone, we walked around the other side of the felled tree to look where it had been standing. When we got around there, a collection of pine cones was sitting on the ground. There were actually two different types of cones, and they were exactly like the ones that had hit Danielle. What was strange was that they weren't from any of the trees that were near us. We assumed that the Sasquatch had brought them there only to leave them behind after it had been seen. It was completely bizarre and unreal. Why this creature had decided to toss some pine cones at us is anyone's guess. We will never know for sure. Perhaps it wanted us to see it. But who really knows? What we do know is that it had obviously brought these pine cones with it from somewhere else. And perhaps seeing us both sleeping had decided to have a little fun with us. We will never know. On to the next one. I had a face-to-face -face meeting with an overly large and exceptionally spooky mountain monster. I can now honestly say I met a Sasquatch. I spent the last 15 years living on the Oregon coast, and although we moved here from Northern California, where the people are all not that different, the lifestyle is more relaxed here and I have been able to hike in some truly wild areas. I can see why this strange animal is seen and reported, yet still remains unknown, because it lives where most people would never go. I would never have seen the one I did, had it not happened that I sort of dropped in on it. Occasionally, I enjoy just going back in some fairly non-scenic place where I won't run into a constant troop of other hikers, photographers, exercise fanatics and kids. Having lived most of my life in and around population, sometimes it's nice to just be alone. To do that in the mountains of Oregon is difficult because it's just too beautiful. Sometimes I look for the seemingly unattractive areas in hopes I may find an unusual rock formation, gnarly tree branch, or just maybe find something that four million other people haven't seen. Well, this trip was even more than I could have bargained for. It was up on what is called Bald Knob in an area in the Rogue River Siskiyou National Forest. I'd gone up a road that was more of a trail, but not inviting. I'm sure to most people, 
because this particular route was full of large sized rocks. I was up fairly high, and I could see Humbug Mountain, but this area was just not anything that would draw visitors, so it was just what I was searching for. The road on the other side of this hill got worse, so I knew I'd have a private area to explore. I parked off the ruts and grabbed my pack, set off down in what looked like a really secluded canyon. The road soon ended, but there was a shadowy gulch that led down to my left, and I found myself in a beautifully sheltered canyon that was virtually covered with pine trees. There seemed to be a well-traveled animal trail that kept suddenly descending into this ever-deepening canyon. So I figured I couldn't get lost by staying on it, so I spent about two hours following it. I had to go quite slow, so I'm not sure how far down I was when I heard the sound of water splashing off to my right, and it seemed like it was almost directly below me. Leaving the trail, I slowly climbed hand over hand over a couple of huge boulders laying on the steep slope, and the sound got louder. And now I could see part of a small waterfall coming from the cliff to my upper right, so I carefully went around the huge boulder. I had to hold on to its side with my fingers as my feet kept slipping on the steep gravel slope as I made my way slowly down until I was directly under the boulder. And then my hands could no longer find anything on which to hold as the rock was too smooth. My feet kept slipping on the open stretch of gravel and then I lost it. I landed on my butt and slid on my back down about 30 feet at a fast pace. And then I dropped right off an abrupt edge and landed hard enough to take the wind out of me. But fortunately, I only dropped about three feet to where I thudded down. And there I sat waiting for the stars to clear. I had landed on a small ledge and below my outstretched legs, the slope dropped down to a very deep funnel-like chute through a really bad looking channel that was lined with huge rock walls. It looked like if you fell down that slope, you just have to keep going all the way to the bottom of the mountain. Fortunately for me, although I had a lot of pain, I wasn't broken. Gathering my senses, I looked around me and there on my right was a small pool that a trickling stream had been splashing into and it flowed off the far corner of the five foot pond and disappeared from view off the back side. Over a huge boulder to the side of the pond and about 30 feet up, there was a huge light brown haired head. It had an ugly face to be sure by human standard, more like a large gorilla like animal with rather large eyes, ears, kind of flat nose with big nostrils and large but flat ears. I couldn't see its hands or arms, so it had to be either laying up there or standing behind that large rock. But all I saw was this very calm but seemingly curious animal. I say that because it had a smooth, dark-skinned face and its brow was wrinkled like an aging human's would look. Then I got courage and very calmly said, Hello. As nervous as I was, I was now more anxious at finding something I never believed really existed. Well, I guess I should have let it make the first move because the animal all of a sudden rose up. A couple of feet turned and disappeared. I saw a lot of long hair, but the rest of its body was behind the rock. Then I heard a couple of thumps, like it must have jumped and ran downward, and then nothing. I was not in good enough shape to try to climb up to where it had been, even if I had gathered enough courage, but I had scrapes and bloody spots all over me, and I was just very lucky to have not broken anything, except maybe my butt. I have never had so many abrasions and bruises at any one time before in my life, and I carefully and painfully made my way back. I think I must have taken three times as long to get home, and it took over a month for the wounds to fairly well heal. You know, the funny thing about all of this is my next-door neighbor is a retired Oregon State employee, and 
He happened to be mowing his front yard when I pulled into my driveway. And when he saw me slowly and painfully climbing out of my Jeep, he came over quickly. I told him the whole story and asked him who I should tell about what happened, thinking at least I'd make the news. He started shaking his head and told me I had better just forget it ever happened because no one would ever print or even accept my story. He wouldn't even allow me to use his name as being a retired forestry worker. He was under a lifetime restriction against reporting, discussing, or even acknowledging the existence of Bigfoot. As I stood there bleeding and suffering bodily and now mentally, he explained that a great many of the BLM, forestry, and other state employees have seen and encountered these creatures, and the ruling about non-disclosure and absolute denial has been in effect ever since the first sighting was reported. The policy has multiple purposes, and after hearing him out, I could understand the devastation that would occur if state agencies admitted the existence of these beings. The forest would be flooded with hunters, and shootings would be rampant. People would create such destruction that it would be chaotic. After listening to his well-rehearsed presentation, I could see it was not his first recital, and I then understood why I, too, need to respect what I had experienced. I did go back to my neighbor again, and he said as long as I didn't reference our previous conversation or use his name, there was no problem. On to the next one. I am very excited to announce that on this channel we are offering membership. Now, I never want my subscribers to feel like I am paywalling content, so new videos will remain 100% completely free. The membership is a way for those who feel like they want to support me to do so and help the channel grow monetarily. What your membership gives you access, though, to are subscriber badges, which evolve with how long you've been a member, and you can watch your badge grow from a baby Bigfoot all the way up to a sage Bigfoot. Also, as a member, you'll get access to member-only emojis, which are these beautiful Bigfoot emojis. Again, I never want to paywall any content on this channel. I always want the content to be free because I love the community and I want you to enjoy your time here. But if you do wish to support me making this content, this membership is a way for you to do that. Thanks for listening, and on to the next one. Scott claimed that he saw the Spotsville monster in Basket, Kentucky, back in 1984, when he was just six years old. It was broad daylight when he walked into his bedroom on Dr. Hodge Road and saw a terrifying man-like creature looking at him from his window. It was big and covered in hair. The monster had a heavy brow ridge, not a lot of hair on its face, if any, and solid red eyes. Needless to say, the incident scared the life out of him. He screamed out, then ran and told his dad what he had just seen. His dad grabbed the shotgun and went outside to look. But by the time he got around to that side of the house, the thing was gone. Scott said his dad fired a couple of shots into the air just to make sure. The yard on that side of the house was sloped downward. His dad told him that whatever it was had to be at least nine feet tall to look in the window described. There were no footprints left behind. Scott revealed that his first impression of the creature was that it was extremely evil. He could feel the evil when he looked in that thing's eyes and it looked very old. The hair was thinning on the top of its head, and it had a large, thin, prominent nose and white skin. Its face looked like an 80-year-old man's, with solid, red, evil-looking eyes. It was darn scary, like looking into the face of pure evil. It might have just been because I was so young and impressionable, but I don't think so. All I know is it was scary, and I'll never forget it as long as I live. I was so glad when we moved out of that house. Were there more details about the creature that he could see? Did it have ears? Yes. 
like a man's, but almost pointed, not as round as a man's. What about its neck? As far as I could tell, it was built just like a human, only a lot bigger. He estimated that the hair covering the creature's body and head was between six to eight inches long. Adam Candler claimed that on the evening of July 14, 2005, he was driving down Green River Road Number 2, just off T.S. Charner Road in Spotsville, Kentucky, when he noticed a large, dark object stooping down in a roadside ditch. When his vehicle approached to within a few yards of the object and ran on two legs to a nearby field, it was seven to eight feet tall, he said, and looked like a man with slightly longer arms and covered all over with black hair. Adam did state that two other members of his family and one of his personal friends have seen the same creature known locally as the Spotsville Monster in the same general area. The Spotsville Monster has been around a long time and is still being seen regularly in the area. It can be argued that the Geneva Giant and the Hebbardsville Hillbilly are merely more localized monikers for the same creature or same type of creature at the very least. In any event, on January 4, 2012, 12-year-old Samuel was walking on his family's 14-acre woodlot near Corydon, Kentucky, when he heard a series of low pig-like grunts. As he turned, he saw something big and brown run away on all four legs and disappear into the woods. He could not see much detail, only the legs, which he described as hair-covered and thin as the creature fled. He ran home and excitedly told his grandmother, Dora, what had happened. Whether she believed him or not is hard to say, but only a couple of days later, he once again ran into the house and told her he'd found a strange footprint in the woods. Dora accompanied Samuel to the place and saw the print for herself. It was strange looking enough that she went and got plaster of Paris and made a mold of the impression. A few days after Samuel found the track, he had seen the creature again. This time, it was sitting a good distance away, with its back turned to him. It was apparently eating something as every few seconds it would bring up its left hand, which was human-like, up to its mouth. According to the witness, this one was dark-colored or black and bigger than a man. Samuel watched the thing for about five minutes. Once, it acted like it had heard something, cocking its head up and looking around for a few seconds. Having seen enough, Samuel felt it was time to leave. He started backing away, he said, but he slipped and made a noise. When he looked back at the creature, it had apparently heard because it was staring right at him. It had a black face. Whether this was due to skin color or the entire face being covered in hair was too far away to tell, with a heavy brow ridge and shiny eyes. Sam played it cool, walking calmly as if he hadn't seen the thing. Once out of visual range of the creature, however, he ran as fast as he could back home. Dora showed the plaster cast of the track to a local DNR official, who, she said, had no idea what could have made it. She felt that it might be a cat print, as the eastern cougar has been steadily making its way back into these parts for the last 40 years. But, on first glance, it's far too big to be a cat print of any kind. Julia Mathers believes she saw the Spotsville monster one night on the evening of July 14, 2014, while she was driving down Wolf Hills Road just behind Audubon State Park. It was just after 10 o'clock at night. I was working over in Evansville at the time and was driving home from work. I was just passing Green River Road number one rounding the curve when I noticed a large dark figure standing on the side of the road. It was standing about 10 feet back off the road and it was huge. She slowed down to get a better look. It just stood there as I drove by. It didn't move. It was shaped like a man, but it was a lot bigger than a man, at least eight feet tall and covered in dark black hair or fur. 
I didn't see any eyes or facial details. She drove past it once she saw what it was. I was so scared. I mean, this thing was scary. The area of John James Audubon State Park, which sits along the Ohio River, just across from Evansville, Indiana, has long been the purported stomping ground of giant, hairy humanoids. Such can be said for the entire county of Henderson, from one end to the other, and here are a couple of more reports from the same area. One reported encounter took place in 1986, when the entire Fletcher family came face to face with the unknown in broad daylight as it crossed the road near the entrance to Audubon Park. My mom and dad were taking me and my sister to the park that day, says Lacey Fletcher. We had just entered the park, hadn't even made it all the way down the entrance lane when this big, hairy creature walked out in front of our car. It was quite close to the car, causing her dad to slam on the brakes and come to a complete stop while the thing ambled across the road and into the woods. It walked like a man on two legs, but was huge, about eight or nine feet tall, and covered in dark brown hair. Its face looked kind of like a monkey. My daddy just turned the car around as quick as we could right there, and we left the park. The Spotville monster was seen again on December 23, 2012, by two passing motorists driving down Chanley Road in eastern Henderson County. Chanley Road parallels the largest creek in Henderson, Canoe Creek, and at this location near Zion, the creek is flanked by heavy woods and large strips of untenable land. As their car topped a hill near a small bridge, the two men in the front seat saw what appeared to be the bright yellow eye shine of what they at first thought was some animal standing in the road. Unlike the indigenous fauna of western Kentucky, however, this animal was huge. The eyes, which they claimed were very large, were situated seven to eight feet above ground. Stunned by the sight, they slowed down and continued onward and soon noticed the outline of a large human-like figure covered in jet black hair or fur, standing on two legs like a man. The eye shine suggested to the two that the creature looked at the vehicle, then looked away twice as if trying to decide what to do. It then took only two steps from left to right and was instantly out of the road and gone from sight. Their reaction was to hit the gas and speed away from the area, but after about an hour, they gathered up the courage and, according to them, returned to the scene. The creature was gone, but they were able to inspect the area at which it disappeared and found that in only two steps, whatever it was had exited the road and cleared a steep six-foot-high embankment before disappearing from sight. Both witnesses were extremely amazed at the seemingly impossible feat. Neither witness had ever believed in Bigfoot until the moment of the sighting, and certainly weren't expecting to see it that night. One of the witnesses had lived in the area his entire life, but has never seen or heard anything like it. The incident lasted only a few seconds, yet both witnesses say they knew that the shadowy figure must have been Bigfoot because it looked exactly like the pictures and drawings they had seen over the years. Canoe Creek is the largest creek that runs through the county, and throughout the years, sightings of this nature have occurred from one end of the creek to the other. Steve Jones claimed for several nights back in 2011, the entire Greystone subdivision, which sits on the backside of Audubon State Park, just up the road from Julia Matthews sighting, was disturbed by a series of incredibly loud fierce sounding screams unlike any that he had ever heard before or since. They begin every night at nine or ten o'clock and last sporadically for two to three hours. When asked to describe the vocalizations as best as he could, he said that they were long blood curdling screams, high pitched at first and ending with a lower guttural growl. For the life of him, he could not attribute the sound to any known living animal. The screams lasted for 10 to 15 seconds each, and they were loud. I'm talking so loud that it almost shook your wall, 
You know, I know darn well every single resident of Gladstone had to have heard them. There's no animals around here that can make a sound like that, except for one, the Spotsville monster. On to the next one. I'm a night owl. I was working on my computer. It was about two in the morning. I live in an apartment complex on the east side of Kent, Ohio. Next to the complex, there is a lot of woods that run back for quite a bit. I usually have my windows open as well. It was pretty quiet that night. All of a sudden, I heard a loud bang like something hit something else, followed by three or four loud yelling noises that were not human or a house pet. It was very different. It sounded what is described as a yell that a Bigfoot might make. It sure sounded like it. I'm being dead serious about this. From what it sounded like, it came from the woods behind the apartment complex, either on or near the railroad tracks. Trust me, this was not a train. On to the next one. In Utopia, Ohio, in Brown County, this is a very rural area. My closest neighbors are about a quarter mile away. We have three dogs, a 100-pound Rottweiler, a 70-pound bird dog or hunting dog, and an 80-pound shepherd mix. The Rottweiler barks mostly at animals. The bird dog barks at anything making noises. And the shepherd only barks if he hears or sees something too close to the house. These dogs are very close to our house. All three dogs were barking like crazy, carrying on pretty bad. I said to my fiancé, what are they barking at? I'd like to get some sleep. We thought it was deer or coyote. Well, about a minute after that, the dogs got dead quiet, not a peep. So I started to relax. Not a minute after they got quiet, I heard a yell that I have never heard before. It sounded like a man with a deep, grumbly voice that was yelling, Ah! It was loud, and the voice got deeper at the end, almost like it was mad. Well, it brought chills to me. I asked my fiancé if he had heard it. He said he did, but he was half asleep. I was wide awake. The dogs never made another sound. I know that noise we heard was not a cat or a dog. I'm not familiar with the sound of a mountain lion, but as the old cliche goes, it didn't sound completely human, but it didn't sound completely animal. My fiancé and I had just laid down to go to sleep, but the dog's barking was keeping me up. I asked a neighbor across the street a half a mile down if she heard anything. She had been asleep at that time. It was about 40 degrees. There was a barge moving down the river. Right after we heard the noise, the barge shined a light on our hill. Oddly enough, in the direction the sound came from, that was the first time that a barge has shone a light on our hill that I'm aware of. Barges do shine lights along the banks, but we're about a half a mile from the bank, through some trees and across a road. Just a coincidence. Or did someone on the barge see something? I don't know. Our house sits in the foothills of the river, not on the top of the hill. It's just at the bottom right before it gets flat. The hills are full of trees, but the field at the bottom doesn't have trees. On to the next one. At 1 a.m. in June, in Dungansville, in Adams County, Ohio, the witness was watching television when she heard her dog barking outside. When she turned the porch light on, she observed a strange creature alongside the pond in her front yard, about 30 feet away. The creature was about three to four feet tall, gray in color. It had large, dark eyes. It had long arms. It was emitting a gurgling sound. The creature appeared to have hair or fur all over its body. It looked at the witness for a few seconds, then headed toward a tent on the southern part of the pond. It kind of skipped when it moved and appeared to walk on its hind legs while using the knuckles on its front arms on the ground. When it reached the tent, it again looked at the witness. 
At this time, the dog started chasing after it, but the witness called them back. The creature was last seen moving along a barbed wire fence. Shortly afterward, the witness heard a screeching sound from that direction. On to the next one. On Williams Road, near Alum Creek Drive and Williams Road, in Columbus, in Franklin County, in Ohio, one morning in the middle of June, it was early on a Saturday morning, my mom was on her way to work. She was driving down Williams Road at around 7 a.m. There wasn't much traffic on the road, but when she crossed an overpass, she saw something stooped over in the road. As she got closer, it stood up. It looked at her just for a couple of seconds, then walked away. It just stepped over the guardrail and was gone. And only one week later, on the news, someone else had seen it also. They even had a drawing of it on TV. My mom said it was the same thing she had seen. This is the first time she has ever seen anything strange like that. It really makes us all wonder. The color of the thing was a reddish brown. The head was very large and hairy. It was twice as big as a bear's head. When it raised up, it walked on two feet. It only took a couple of steps. It stepped over a guardrail, and as soon as it stepped over the guardrail, it was in a large wooded area. It's a long road with lots of trees on both sides. On one side of the road is a large quarry, a place where we used to go four-wheeling, it's right off Alum Creek Drive. Only a week later, it was on the news. Mom had told us about it. We just kind of pushed it aside till someone else saw it in the same area. On to the next one. While canoeing outside the town of Ludenville, nearest major road is State Road 3 near Wally Road in Holmes County in Ohio. I was on a canoe trip with a bunch of friends from school. There were five canoes, each with two people in them. We had canoed about a mile when we came to a fork in the river. According to the map, the two eventually link up about one to one and a half miles later, so we decided to race. The canoes that went down the fork on the left-hand side that had the road next to it. My canoe and another went down the fork that was in the woods. Upon entering the fork, we became very aware of a very pungent smell of a decaying material. Soon, we were in the middle, and all the trees but blocked out the sky. We stopped for a bathroom break along the river, and on the opposite side, we noticed a shadow in the trees. We passed it off as a deer. We continued our trip. We noticed that the smell had gotten closer, and when a female companion glanced toward the smell, she silently froze. She said she saw a black, six-and-a-half to seven-foot-tall creature observing us. We doubled our paddle speed and noticed that it was following us behind the tree line. Soon, we noticed a bend in the river. That is when the creature took off and ran toward the bend. We idled in the river, waiting, and then heard a big splash. We began to paddle toward the bend and noticed just in time to see it coming up onto the opposite bank of the river. It had to cover over 200 yards in 30 seconds. We thought our encounter was over, but later thought crossing an open clearing casually. We thought we heard tree changing from a high to low pitch about 20 minutes after that, after the last visual sighting. It was along a very murky and eerie feeling river. Big temperature change and quiet. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!